Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Bernoulli with Israeli News Live, the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. Today's message is going to really dive deep into multiple subjects that are all interconnected, and many times most people probably never had any clue that they were. Jacob's Ladder, the woman at the well, the cornerstone. Uh, all of those types of passages that we're looking at today are, are actually connected to one another. Uh, Philip, when, when Jesus says to him, you're going to see, because he believes, you're going to see greater than this. You're going to see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Uh, we're going to get into these things today and I think it's really going to help you out, out a lot. Also, again, going back to praying in your closet. Are these all connected? I believe they are. Let's go, go ahead and let's get started right off, right off from the very beginning here. I want to start over here in the Gospel of John, chapter 4. Now, if you recall, this is where Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. And, of course, he talks about, you know... Uh, Wanting a drink of water, she says to him, you know, sir, the well's deep. You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. We don't have any dealings with one another. Then Jesus goes on to say, if you knew who it was that was talking to you, you would ask me for a drink, and I would give you water that you don't even have to come here for it. That's provocative in itself. If you think about what he's saying, I'll give you water that you don't even have to come and draw from this well. You know, he did, after all, multiply the fish. He did, at that wedding supper, multiply, turn water to wine. He did multiply the bread. Whatever they had need of, he was able to be the provider, the sustainer. He was what? He was the bread of life. He was the manna in the wilderness. But it gets even deeper than that. Let's start off right after he goes through all this with her. And here's what happens in the conversation. She says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Now when she's saying you say, she's talking about because he was Jewish. But that wasn't the answer of Jesus. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes. When you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Oh, well then why is there such a great interest in building the third temple? Oh, why is there such a great interest that we have to go learn from the Pharisees? If you're not going to worship Jerusalem or at that mountain. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour comes, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. You mean to tell me all these services that were going on in the temple in the days that when Jesus was here on the earth, that the Father was still seeking for someone to worship him in spirit and in truth, and it wasn't happening? what he says. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Not just in the spirit, but and in truth as well. All right. Now I'm kind of debating. Do I want to go into Jacob's ladder next? Or do I want to go where David in the Psalms speaks about the cornerstone? Because after all, we know that Jesus quotes that too, that the master builders rejected the cornerstone and that cornerstone became the head, headstone. Maybe we'll go into Jacob's ladder. I, I, I really don't know which one's the better one to go into. All right, you're going to learn something about Jacob's ladder you, you may have never known before. Maybe you already know. I don't know. I might be the guy that's kind of goofy and just figuring these things out and you guys know about it already. So pardon my ignorance if that's the case. All right, we know that Jacob, he went out from Beersheba, and he went toward Haran. He's going to his father-in-law's house there, or his, yeah, well, no, I'm sorry, his uncle's house. 
the issue came up between him and Esau, and his mother sends him away to go uh, live with Laban for a little while, which we know the story later. He marries uh, uh, Rivka and, uh, and, and uh, or excuse me, uh, he gets married to Leah, he gets married to Rachel, whom he loves, marries their handmaids as well, has children by them. Oh, we know all the story there. Anyway, but on his way, he stops at a place there, and it says here, he lighted, on a, uh, lighted up on the place and tarried there all night because the sun was set, and he took one of the stones in the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, angels of God ascending and descending on it. Now, a couple of things I want you to pay attention to. One, he doesn't only go to sleep in this place where he's at, but he also lays a stone there and lays his head upon that stone. And he goes to sleep, and while he's sleeping, he has this amazing dream. And behold, the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, thy father, the God of Isaac. The land whereon you liest, to thee will I give it, and to your seed. Now, I know that <laughs> Tovia Singer doesn't like it when you point out that it's singular. Zerah, Ule Zeracha, your seed, but nonetheless, it's singular. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, we do have it in the plural. So don't try to say there's no such thing as seeds plural. Yes, there is. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in you and in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with you and will keep you wheresoever you go and will bring you back into this land. For I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to you to the of. All right. Now, that's speaking of the coming of Jesus Christ, by the way, because he is that seed. And Jacob wakened out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How full of awe is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, the house of God. But the name of the city was Luz at the first. Now, I can't say whether or not Jacob really knew the significance of what happened there or if he looked at it more in the carnal aspect. Because he lays that stone there, what would be called Jerusalem. This is where they believe the temple was built, the first and second temple. You know, could it be that Jacob thought it was some portal there uh, that he had reached when he came there, and this is where the house of God should be built. I don't really know if that's the case or not, but one thing I do know is that what happened to Jacob is what Jesus talks about when he tells you to enter into your closet and pray, and the Heavenly Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Remember, we went there and I showed you, and let me see, I think it's this one here. Nope. Uh, when you pray, enter into your closet, and when you have shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which sees in secret shall reward you openly. In the Hebrew Matthew, he says, go in there and lay down on your couch. And close the doors, your eyes. And your Father, which sees in secret, will reward you openly. 
you see, the, the, the human body, the mind, uh, whatever you want to, however this works, I don't know how God really breaks all that down. But when you go to pray, you're going into the spirit. See, Jesus says the kingdom of God is within you. You are the temple of Almighty God. And going and to get into the Spirit is literally going within your own self. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to necessarily lay down and for this to always to happen. But in the case of Jacob's ladder, and in the case of what Jesus says, but when you pray, pray, do not ask vain repetitions as the heathen do, for you think that you shall be heard for, the, for your much speaking. Be ye not therefore like unto them, for your Father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He gives you a simple prayer to play. Pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will forgive also you, you forgive you yours. The, the point is you're going in to, the, to a prayer, especially in the evening time just like Jacob did, to such a place as you put your mind on him. Remember I shared with you in one of the messages there, you know, that where the heart is, that's where your treasure is. So when you're getting ready to go to bed at night and you go and you, and some people might literally go into a physical closet to pray, that's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. The point is, is getting into the spirit. Going in within yourself, you know, because, the, like I said, the kingdom of God is within. Now, let's pull that up. I, I, I say that, but let's pull it up to just to be certain on this, okay? Um, neither shall they say, lo, here, there. Yes, here it is. Luke 17, 21. And when he was uh, demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And he said to his disciples, The days will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you shall not see it. And they shall say to you, See here or see there. Go not after them, nor follow them. For as a lightning, you know, um, lighteth out of one part under heaven, shineth through another part under heaven, so shall the Son of Man be in his day. All right? But see, but the important thing is, is to know that the kingdom of God is within you. And also, you are the temple of God. Okay? Remember that. Ye, and I think this is actually like by Paul or something there that talks about that. Let's see. Here we go right here, 1 Corinthians 3, 17. Just one example, there's many. If any, man, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. The word temple is not there, but he says which you are. In other words, implying to the antecedent, the temple of God. You are the temple of God. All right? So we know that, and then we apply this, and so we come back. We know to enter into the closet. We see that Jacob basically, what, what was Jacob doing when he did this over here? He was fulfilling that very thing that Jesus said. He had actually entered into his own closet. He had, as he went to go to sleep, he had this dream. And then Jacob feels like that he is literally at the gateway of heaven. And he calls it Bethel, the house of God. Well, he was in the house of God, because why? He was the house of God. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way, I will go with uh, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, and shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. 
He was God's house. The vision that he saw or the dream that he had was not, it was within him. Okay, now let me show some more to you on this. The same thing, a very similar thing that happened with Nathaniel, right? Nathaniel said unto him, Can there be anything? All right, let me back up. Philip findeth Nathaniel, saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel said unto him, Can there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said unto him, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Nathanael said unto him, when, when do you know me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. That's powerful. He had already seen him in vision. He knew where he, see, and, and now Nathaniel knows that Jesus is, already knows that he's, he was praying under the fig tree. He already knew it. Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto you, I saw you under the fig tree, believest you? You believe? Believest thou? You shall see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. That's Jacob's ladder right there, right? That's Jacob's ladder. What did Jacob see? Uh, he was laid in a dream. Behold, a ladder set upon the earth, and the top reached unto heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And then what does God tell him about? He tells him about his seed. So when he saw those angels of God ascending and descending, and then God says, And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad the west, the east, the north, and the south, and in you and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now he's talking about his physical children as well that he's going to have, but he's also talking about the promised seed. And the angels that were ascending and descending were no doubt ascending and descending on Jesus Christ, his own son, uh, or you know what would be his descendant. And then we find there that Nathaniel. Jesus said would see the same thing, that the angels, the heaven would be open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. But again, remember, you are that temple. Let me share with you some more. Psalm 118. Actually, before I do that, let me do Matthew uh, right here. This is Matthew 21. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto these, to those husbandmen? Remember, they were cruel and they were killing all the servants, everything they did. And then finally God sends his son and the servants kill the son as well, right? They say to him, he will miserably, Jesus is telling the story, by the way, to the Pharisees. And so he asked them, when the Lord therefore of the vineyard comes, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him fruits in their season. Jesus said unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. The headstone that the builders rejected. I don't know about you. I have wondered for a long time. I mean, we always look at this as being Jesus Christ, and truly it is. But the scripture says that the builders had rejected the, corner, the cornerstone, and that cornerstone became the headstone. Therefore say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits of thereof. What is that cornerstone that got rejected? Let's look at Psalm 118 where it actually comes from. 
Open to me, David says, the gates of righteousness, and I will enter into them. I will give thanks unto the Lord. See, pitahu li shari tzedach. Open me the gates of right. He wanted to know how he could get in, how he could get into the place of righteousness. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteousness shall enter into it. And I will give thanks unto you, for you have answered me and are become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And it literally doesn't say chief cornerstone, le roche pena. It has become the headstone. It has become the, the head of the corner, literally the head of the corner or the head of the turn. Pena is to turn. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. What stone did the builders really reject? Go back to what Jacob did. What happened here? And he lighted upon the place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. I used to always think to myself, a stone for a pillow, that has got to be rough, right? But it's symbolic is why. Not that he didn't really do it, but it's still symbolic. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set upon the earth, and the top of it reached to the heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Now Jacob later talks about this is the house of God. But what people miss is the fact of the stone that he laid up, that he poured the oil on. Isn't it interesting that when the prophet came, like Samuel come to anoint David to be the king, what did he do? He poured the oil upon his head. It's no coincidence. You see, when you go into your closet and you go to pray, you're entering in to the gates that David was talking about, the gates of righteousness. Because when you enter in, you're entering into the Spirit. And that stone that the builders rejected was how to get in the presence of Almighty God. The, the very stone that, that Jacob laid up that day and poured that oil on was showing symbolically that the way into the temple of Almighty God, the way in was right through his own mind as he went into the spirit realm and he entered in, as David said, into the gates of righteousness. That's the stone that the builders rejected. And that stone, that cornerstone, the foundation that Jacob laid right there at Bethel in Jerusalem, it had nothing to do with a physical building, but rather it had to do with a spiritual temple. And, and Jacob himself was the temple. And that stone was only symbolic that his head laid upon, but that stone become the headstone. He's showing you in symbology that within your own thinking, within your own mind, entering into the temple of God, within yourself, as he said, you are the temple. And when you enter into the temple of God, that's the one you don't, you don't want to reject that because you meet Jesus Christ there. That's the gates to righteousness. That's why he put that stone there. I doubt, like I said, I don't think Jacob maybe even really understood what he did it for. Nathaniel, though, he also was seeing the same thing, right? This is, this is just blows me away. So that's why Jesus tells him when you pray and you close your, you know, enter in your closet when you have shut the door, pray to your father which is in secret and thy father which sees in secret shall reward you openly. And so when you begin to recognize the temple is not a building in the Middle East, but you are the temple. We each one represent the temple of God. And the cornerstone that was rejected was your way to get to Christ. 
He is the headstone, but also it is symbolic in showing you how you pray, how you get to God, how you get into his presence. And you don't have to have a whole lot of words. He will reward you openly. I hope somehow or another, let me see if we're, make sure I didn't leave anything off, right? Therefore, I send you the king. Okay. Now, this is the other part there. Did you ever read the scriptures with the stone which the builders rejected? The same became the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. See, you would think, what has that got to do with the fact that the husbandman didn't deliver the fruit thereof? Therefore, I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth fruits thereof. Those that would quit going to a carnal temple. See, God seeks those to worship him in spirit and in truth. Right? Isn't that what he said? That's what he said to the woman. But the hour cometh now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. But remember what he said too, right? Um... Woman, or she said, you know, you. She's trying to say, you say that we, that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. They figured the only way to get to God was in the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when the, you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Build all the temples you want in Jerusalem. You've missed the mark. If you don't recognize that you are the temple of God and in you, just when you go to pray and seek the Father, then you have received the headstone. Then you will bring forth the fruit that he is looking for because what he said, that the kingdom was going to be taken from them and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard this parable, they perceived that he spoke of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. I, I don't know what else to say. I pray, I, my desire sincerely is that God will open your eyes to see what I just shared with you. Because to me, it is, it, it's blowing me away to see these things. God bless you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your support as well. Those of you that want to support the work, we appreciate it greatly. Um, and I just thank you kindly. Our, our mailing address is above my head. And here on our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. You just click on the link there and you can donate that way if God lays that upon your heart. Thank you and good evening.